We are back with another episode of Investigating Innovation with the I2C. I'm your host, Madison Travis, and on today's Spark Spotlight, we're sitting down with Bob Nance from The Cyber Company. We're going to be asking him about how his company has changed over the last year, what his industry looks like globally and also here in Huntsville, and what we can expect from them and their services here in the Rocket City. Let's roll. Hey, Bob, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, Sitting out here on my back porch and listening to the birds sing. That's the best way to spend a Monday afternoon, really. (laughs) The weather is so nice lately, too. I mean, you really can't complain. Um, So uh, we're so excited to have you on the podcast today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, introduce uh, you, you, your company. Uh, Give us the rundown, I guess. Okay. Well, the most important things first, uh, I've been married and have two children, and they're both, well, one graduates from Auburn this year, and the other one lives in Chicago. So, so we're, uh, we, we've spread our children around. Uh, <laughs> my wife is a school teacher. And so, um, I, I, as she said years ago, when I got a job as a school teacher, she said, only one of us can be a school teacher. The other one has to have a real job. So uh, up until 2005, I worked for various government contractors. I, I got out of the Navy in uh, 86, went back to school finished my degree in physics and then worked for uh, NC State. Well, I worked for Auburn for two years as a um, full-time temporary employee working in the, what they call the digital equipment repair facility, the DERF as we called it, spread backwards. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the DERF uh, took care of the hardware for the university and then university computing took care of the software. And what they found was that there were um, always arguments between whether something was hardware or software. And so I got hired to be the guy stuck in between. There you um, go. <laughs> I, went, I went from there to work at NC State in their physics department, worked at the nuclear accelerator at Duke, and then worked for um, the science house. And one of my jobs there was to um, juggle. I mean, I, I, I took a, um, a road show out to junior highs and high schools around uh, Virginia and North Carolina. And I had liquid nitrogen and a bed of nails and, you know, big mallets to hit people with. And, and I had to learn to juggle, um, but it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. But after my grant money ran out, I decided to go back to what I enjoy, what I really enjoyed, which was working with computers because they don't talk back. Um, so I started working uh, for the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences in Durham as a, um, a Unix system administrator working on the uh, genetic sequencing for genes, which this is in 91, 92, somewhere in there, and up to 93, which was part of the Human Genome Project. So I worked there for two years, and then uh, my wife got pregnant, and we decided to move closer to family. Family was in Birmingham, so I started looking for work, got this really out-of-the-blue job offer to come work for the um, Army as, in their modeling and simulation group, being their Unix system administrator. So moved to Huntsville. I'd only been to Huntsville once. I didn't know anything about the town. Lived here for 25 years. So I've never lived anywhere in my life more than four years. I've lived here for 25 years. But the uh, um, after a few years working as a contractor through three different companies uh, in 2005, well, in 2001, I started a company with some friends. In 2005, I bought them out and went full-time working in this company. That company is Novation Systems. We're a full service IT service shop that takes care of IT for smaller companies that don't have their own IT IT department. So we've been doing that since 2005 full time. And then in 2018, uh, partnered with uh, Jonathan um, uh, Roswag, who uh, owns Datacata for us to develop a uh, a system for um, cybersecurity reporting for small businesses because it was a government mandate for them to be able to do logging and reporting for auditing for security purposes to the government. And the cost of those services was in the thousands of dollars. And most of the companies that were being asked to do it didn't have thousands of dollars in their IT budget. In fact, I knew because I was working with these companies that getting a thousand dollars out of them was a three month process. So we started working on a lower cost way of doing that. And that's when we came up with the cyber company. And so the cyber company was developed from the beginning to provide innovative and inexpensive ways to provide cybersecurity without having to pay an arm and a leg for it. Um, the, what, what we based it on was there's a series of software, there's a bunch of software out there 
that allows you to uh, monitor your systems for performance, for security, for uh, uptime, all the things that you need to worry about efficiency. Um, those are very expensive and they're paid for by large companies to keep their very large services online. And nobody needed all that fancy stuff. They needed something that just kept these logs and told them when there was a problem. So that's what we were developing. So. Awesome. Yeah. It, and especially, I think, you know, like you said, you've never been anywhere more than four years, but here in Huntsville, um, especially with the way it's looking, there's going to be such an opportunity, especially for a company like yours to reach those small businesses. Cause there are so many people who are pursuing entrepreneurship here in the rocket city because they realize that markets and industries are about to really just explode here. Um, and it's going to be yeah. a huge growth period um, for entrepreneurs like yourself who have, who have been in the in the game for a minute, but also those newer ones who are looking for help from people like you and also looking to expand their own business. Um, so super awesome. Uh, such a diverse background, which I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs can relate with that diversity. And then they finally kind of land on, um, you know, they're like, oh, I realized that this is, you know, eventually what I, what I wanted to be working on the whole time um, and then you finally realize that point but you know for you um was there like a specific light bulb moment or like you know one of those like oh like this is what I you know what I need to work on um that made you start this or was it more of like a process like what did that look like as an entrepreneur so there were several things that occurred in the early 2000s I had several friends who, had, who were in the small business market uh, one was a psychologist office, another one was a uh, mechanic, and a third one was um, running a uh, warehouse company, a art supply company. And all three of them were paying exorbitant amounts of money for people to come in and take care of their computer systems. And so even though this is not a light bulb moment specifically for the cyber company, the light bulb moment for me was that there are not enough well-qualified people that work with companies as opposed to working for them. So I could easily go to somebody and say, yeah, I can take over all your systems and charge you, you know, $1,000 a month, $2,000 a month, and, and everything will be taken care of. And that's a wonderful way to go if that's the market you're in. But what I found in most cases is that people didn't want to tear up what they were doing. They wanted their computers and everything else to work for them. So I instead came up with the idea of working as a partner for people. And so in the cyber, so the light bulb moment for that fed over into the cyber company in that we have been working with companies that are needing to meet this government mandate to meet the security needs of the government. And we're working with them to find out exactly what they expect to happen and how they expect it to happen. So that as we develop a product, we want somebody to be able to simply click two, three, four buttons and have something ready to deploy. In our case, what we're hoping to do is actually release our product to the public domain to open source. And then when uh, and then in turn, we then provide services for that product. Um, so the cyber company then becomes the hosting company to help people who to maintain these systems. So by moving from the product model to the subscription model, not only are we able to minimize our cost, minimize the cost for our customers, but we're also able to get feedback, constant feedback, so that the product itself gets to be improved. So that's, and that's a key thing for us is that it's all process. Nothing is, here is your sealed box with your software in it, goodbye. This is, we're running this service. Oh, look, you want it to do this? Great, we can do that for you. That'll be in our next iteration. So we use all agile tools. Everything that we do is on a constantly uh, developing um, cycle. There's no, we, we, we don't just produce a product and deliver it. We're pro constantly producing a different product and releasing it as, the, as, as we're able to. Yeah. So um, those are, some light bulb things for me is that people need flexibility and, and nobody was providing it. Right. And that is so true, especially since like you, you had mentioned, you are serving those smaller size companies and those people are looking for something that that's simple that they can use and that's not going to overwhelm them. And, you know, it's going to be unreliable or something that they feel like they don't know enough about um, to where they're constantly having to reach out to someone um, to fix that. They need something that's going to serve them in some way, um, you know, kind of along the lines of 
it's more of a process. Do you guys um, use a lot of machine learning um, techniques to really understand how your customer is using um, that service or you know, how does that process look? Well, some of what we do requires machine learning because we're looking at events that are occurring on computers and we're trying to correlate those into incidents. So if you get somebody who touches your computer from China, that's not something we're worried about. It's happening all the time. But if all of a sudden you have seven connections to your computer and four other of your computers to China, there may be something going on. And so we need to alert you to that. So there's some machine learning already involved in that. And I'll put in a plug for, uh, for Jonathan and his crew. They are, you know, they're, he's our machine language person. I mean, excuse me, machine language, machine learning. ML is stuck in my head. Um, <laughs> He's our machine learning person, and uh, he's the one who helped us with getting AI involved and figuring out exactly what we're doing with this data. Data is is data. You have to turn it into information, and he's got the tools to do that. So that's that's why the combination of what he's doing and what we're doing helps produce a better product. Yeah, for sure, and that is such an important part to um, to that entire process. I, you know, kind of off off topic but kind of related it, it's so um it's so common to see this um collaboration amongst entrepreneurs in the i2c too um so yes. i think that's always uh just kind of refreshing as uh, someone who does work for the i2c to see that happen um and really see that um turn into a relationship that doesn't just benefit one party but both and not just the clients but it's really just um an experience that makes everything worthwhile too um but was being an entrepreneur something that you ever thought you were going to do or you know was that something that just kind of caught you off guard that you decided to pursue i've always had little projects on the back burner things that i'd like to do um i helped uh, back in the beginnings of the open source movement in the 80s I helped develop some code for some small projects and uh, kind of got the bug then that I wanted to do something innovative, something new. Um, but I've always kind of stuck with the, I have a job, it gives me a paycheck and I have benefits. Yeah. And uh, this, as a, a great um, uh, gratitude to my wife, when I decided in 2005 to go full time, she decided to go back and start teaching again. Yeah. And so she brought us health insurance. So that gave me the freedom to be able to miss a paycheck or two if I had to. And so yeah. uh, by the time I got around to this project and what we're doing with it, I believe I kind of got to the point where I was willing to take a little bit more risk because I know that I had something to fall back on. Um, you know, I have some money in savings. I have a little bit of retirement. It's not enough. It's never enough. <laughs> but um, I, But I built up to that. And the one thing about this company that's different than other things that I've worked on in the past is this is completely bootstrapped. I never had anybody give me any money. Uh, we don't have any investors of any kind. So if we rise or fall, it's entirely on our own. And if we make it, we're going to get the benefit. If we don't make it, we'll just move on to the next thing. Yeah. Um, I, I think you kind of have to have that attitude of you got to push through and whatever happens is is going to happen. Uh, so um, it's up to you. And at the end of the day, you're the one in, you know, in control to some extent. So you've got to really um, make those calls and uh, push forward. But um, I, I don't think that uh, many people ex many people's entrepreneurial journey turns out how they thought it was going to look, um, regardless <laughs> if you thought you were going to become one or not. Um, so it's always, that's always one of my favorite questions to ask is like, you know, did you see yourself becoming this, this type of um, employee or was it going to be something completely different? Um, it's definitely not your usual nine to five. Um, nice. so, <laughs> well, you know, as you, you know, you've been working on this, you know, kind of since 2005, you've been kind of dealing with these projects. Um, so, now uh, that you you're, you've kind of transitioned into a different role um, and kind of a different position in the industry, um, how would you actually describe your industry in a in a global sense, um, and how does that differ from the industry that's here in Huntsville? Well, ours is definitely a service based industry. We're not producing a product. We're not. Um, we're not doing direct service for people. So I, I have another company, Novation, yeah. uh, which, you know, is, is really is what is funding the cyber company. Yeah. 
And uh, under Novation, we're working directly for people. So when they have problems, we go directly to their office or we have tools that we use to help them directly. That's a help desk. That's a completely different way of doing things. This side, we're trying to produce a product which stands alone, provides a service, uh, does so at a low cost, and we're providing more of an infrastructure than we are a product. Okay. And, and I mean that product in the sense of uh, there's a lot of government contractors here in town that actually make a, 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 a gadget, a yeah. widget that goes to the government. But the majority of people that are in this town are actually providing services. But ultimately, that service is a product. So like Novation provides a product. It's our services, but it is a product to the customer. This is just the infrastructure part. It's just the insides. Nobody looks at our tool and says, oh, that's the thing I need. They look at our tool and say, oh, that tool is going to get me to where I need to be. So it, it's kind of like um, I can give you a car or I can give you the door to a car. The door serves a purpose. You've got to have it. You've got to have an engine, for instance, but if I just gave you an engine, you, it would be useless to you. You have to have the whole car. So we're not providing the whole car. We're providing just part of it, the door, the engine, the hinge, whatever, the thing that gets you to having a product that you can use. Oh. So it's a little different than what other people in town are doing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes so much more sense. Not like really an intermediary, but you're kind of acting as um, like an additional step to the process, I guess is a better way of putting that. Um, sure. And, you know, adding that flexibility that has been missing, like you addressed already. Um, well, you know, since you are kind of bringing a new perspective and something different to the industry, um, are there any changes that you're seeing in your industry right now, um, especially after a year like 2020? Like what kind of impact did that have on your industry? So it affected us on both sides, both the Novation side and on the cyber company side in that uh, companies started operating from home and they're doing more and more work not in their office. And so from the Novation side, that meant that we were doing a lot more remote work. We weren't going to people's houses to help them. They were calling on the phone and we were helping them over the phone. But it, we learned something new and the government actually is just starting to wrap their head around this as well is that most of our customers don't want to have an internal network and a bunch of security devices. They want to be able to take that laptop and go to Starbucks and use it or go to McDonald's. And they expect that the security on their systems now is going to be on their computer, not on some device that's on their network. So that has changed a lot because instead of the old way of thinking, which is everything is on one wire, You've got a firewall, you've got a intrusion detection system, you've got your web server, you've got your file server, you've got your authentication server all inside this one place. Now, and, and from the cyber company's realm, putting together the situation event monitor. So uh, instead of um, thinking in terms of, I've got these five, six, seven things in a layered approach of protecting your data, and then I have to have the cyber company's um, situation event monitor gather all this information from your LAN and put it up in the cloud so that we can review it. Or the way we did it when we first started this, we were putting everything on a server inside your network. Um, so that was even more separated from the rest of the world. But by putting it up in the cloud, now we have to realize that every single device needs to be treated as a separate device because yeah. they're going to be everywhere. They're going to be at the beach. You're going to be in your at your cousin's house and you're going to go check a report. And we need to know what website you went to that brought some bad thing to you. So there were a lot of things that could that switched from we have this big monolith that we can talk to. And then we have the couple of outliers that aren't part of the monolith to everybody's the outlier now. Yeah. And so in the past year, we have had to change the way we absorb all that information. It comes from all different places now. Yeah. So that has made a big difference. That's something that I guess as, you know, because I'm kind of on the, obviously the other side of that. And it's something that I really haven't you know, fully considered. And like you said, the government's just now wrapping their heads around it. Something I really haven't fully thought about. Um, Cause you know, with digital becoming such a huge thing and with remote becoming pretty much the primary option for many employees, um, oh, yeah. security is becoming a huge thing. But at the same time, 
it used to just be a network security thing that you experienced while you were at work and that didn't really right. matter when you went home. But now your home has to become that network. And so it, it is so reliant on your device um, and your phone and your gosh, <laughs> the phones. I mean, yeah. that's such a big deal. Um, and, and yeah, for such a transition for a company like yours um, of really just rerouting the entire thought pr- process of that and really having to take in so much more information um, and especially with people using so many more devices um, just to get their work done because um, they have one computer here, one, one phone over here that they're working on, this call going on here, this meeting happening here. Um, it's just so many things. But also, you know, as an employee, that's a hard transition too, is getting all those logged on and still making sure that you are maintaining that security factor um, and making sure that you are checking all those boxes is also super important. So you don't want to bypass any of that, but you also want something simple. Um, So I think it's something that everyone's trying to navigate. Um, But We need, you know, (laughs) companies like yours to help mitigate that process and really make sure that it's a smooth one because people are just going to get frustrated if not. Um, You know, people aren't necessarily the most patient when it it comes to things like that. (laughs) And the more frustrated people get, the more mistakes they make because they get so frustrated with it. Yes. And so you end up with people who do really dumb things because they're trying to avoid the frustration. So trying to make it as simple as possible. I, I, you've seen the logo for the, the cyber company, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the penny farthing. Yep. So the, the reason I chose that is because the penny farthing is the simplest bicycle you can ever own, but it is the hardest thing that anybody could ever ride. It is so hard to balance. You, you, you've got to keep constant pressure on the pedals. It's a terrible, terrible design. A regular bicycle, though, is the most complex machine that you can ever imagine, yeah. but it just works. You just pedal and it works. Yep. So the so I kind of look at what we do is we're trying to kind of bridge the gap between we could build a very simple engine, but it would take you a very long time to make it work. So instead, we're going to build a complex engine, but for you, it's going to be as simple as possible. So I just figured the penny farthing, it's, it really shows that that giant wheel in the front and the tiny wheel in the back. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. that's like the, the perfect analogy to me is that is so simple. And don't you ever try to get on one of those. That's so funny. I'm so glad you explained that to me because, you know, I've been wondering that, I, gosh, probably since the beginning, I guess, whenever I first joined the IGC, I love looking at, I mean, that's the marketing in me. I love looking at the logos, obviously. Um, but I mean, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine really anything more perfect as far as the analogy that you have. I mean, it makes perfect sense. And um, it is funny because bicycles are so complex. In one of the classes I'm taking, we're having to do a um, business simulation on a uh, bike production and like we're selling bikes in all these different markets it's a whole thing but um it's funny because we have to design them um and design each of our brands and so there's so many components and so many add-ons that we can have so many gears the different types of handlebars like all these um all these different factors the research and development that we can invest in so it's um it's interesting because then we just hop on one and expect it to work so uh we don't right. think about exactly it. right <laughs> right we don't think much about the process, but um, yeah. So, you know, obviously, like you just mentioned, you had a huge transition over the last year um, and just a lot that you've had to kind of adjust and reevaluate um, one as an entrepreneur, but also um, specifically in your industry. So um, what's the biggest challenge that you say um, you faced as an entrepreneur? <sighs> Time and money. I mean, they are, if I had all the money in the world, I would have 20 people working for me and I'd already have a product, you know, that was rolling and ready to go. I'd have the sealed box that had the key in it. So you could go on the website and start. Um, If I had all the time in the world, then I would take my time and build the right product, but I would do it with three or four people, you know, because, because I would have a tight knit, knit team that would all be working together. Yeah. So if you have a lot of time and a lot of money, you can combine the two and really get rolling fast. I don't have that. You know, I, I, I don't have all the time in the world because I have to have a job that makes money. And so that takes me away from always spending time in this part of the project. 
And then at the same time, I don't have a lot of money because as I said, we bootstrapped the project. There isn't, there are no investors anywhere. So without having that money, I have to get the rent paid and get the services paid for. And, and the I2C has been instrumental in that. They gave us uh, the ability to get uh, the AWS uh, credit program for entrepreneurs. And that has helped us to do a lot of development with very, very little cost. Um, they have helped us with uh, the HubSpot. So we've been able to do some of the marketing, although that's again, another time and money thing. I don't have a lot of time to spend on the marketing part of that. So my HubSpot part is I get in there and went to some of the meetings and then I looked at HubSpot and said, okay, this is beyond me. I'm gonna have to come back to it later. But so I would say that's the key things is time and money and uh, some combination of the two where the where time is, if you have more time, you can get more done. If you have more money, you can get more done. But there's a cross point where you, you can go too far on one or the other. And, and we haven't quite reached that yet. So we're, yeah. we're just working our tails off. <laughs> um, yeah. And I don't know, even if... Uh you get all the time money if you'll ever stop working to death honestly i, I think as Great. an entrepreneur you get you get more of both of them and you end up just working harder um which is just such a funny thing uh to watch um you know entrepreneurs really uh just embrace that um and just keep pushing through um but yeah i mean it's something that entrepreneurs um, across all industries and all markets face um is really just getting the ball rolling really um and, and really hitting that um just that milestone or like that first kind of step um uh, and it's it's a difficult journey no doubt um it's something that is different for everyone across the board um but it's uh i guess kind of an essential part um it's something that everyone has to go through uh and something that looks different for everyone so um kind of along that same line obviously every entrepreneurial journey is very different. Um, everyone's looks either, you know, very difficult, maybe super easy in the beginning. I mean, it looks, it looks different for everyone, but, um, was there like a specific milestone that gave you confidence in your idea and confidence in the business that you were pursuing? So kind of on the opposite end of the last question, was there something that really, um, kind of gave you just the motivation to keep pushing forward? So the, there was kind of an accelerant um, in October, two years ago, we had done some research and talked to some of our own customers to find out if this is a product they'd be interested in. Mm -hmm. And we got a little feedback and decided, well, this is something we want to pursue. Jonathan and I had been working together on some other projects, some small projects around uh, what Novation does. And so Jonathan and I, Jonathan had just been accepted in the ITC and Jonathan said, let's get you into the ITC to work on this project. So the ITC actually provided the accelerant that we needed that would enable us to get in where we needed to go, make the connections and start actual production instead of just thought process. So um, uh, I would say the thing that the, the three things that happened were literally my lease was up. So it was like, hey, you know, maybe I need to be looking for another place followed by Jonathan saying, hey, you've got a great product. Let me take some of this information. Let's see what we can do with it. Followed by Jonathan saying, hey, let's get over to the I2C and talk to Rigvid. So that was our accelerant. That's what really got us going. And we walked in the door and he loved the idea. And we started the next week. We moved in the next week. Yeah. So it has, um, it, it has been a great thing. Well, I, I'm super excited, obviously, to hear that. And I I really enjoy getting to hear more about um, how the I2C specifically helps because I think that um, each company that's there really experiences it in a different way. Um, I think that um, especially Rigvid, uh, he provides a lot of knowledge and insight uh, to a lot of the just the, the processes that kind of get lost in the mix um, that a lot of entrepreneurs maybe just um, maybe overlook or that's just something they haven't considered yet. Um, and I, so I really think that each company there um, truly experiences um, different services and aspects of the I2C in completely different ways. Um, but uh, I think that all of them reap some sort of benefit from being there. 
um, even just the environment really makes you want to get more things done than sitting in your home office does most of the time. Yes. Um, that's, <laughs> that's why I like going up there half the time. I'm like, I've got to get out of this house. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think that getting the ITC and Jonathan's talked about, he's like, well, my, you know, my office used to be getting coffee down at Honest <laughs> downtown. So, yeah. um, you know, there's definitely a huge transition there. Um, but it's really important to really experience those accelerants like you talked about um, as an entrepreneur, because I feel like if those don't hit, um, sometimes that passion can start wearing thin. Um, and it's really important to keep that alive, to keep going. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I, it's exciting that you guys have experienced that. And I can't wait to see um, all those events and the exciting things to start happening again, um, yes. hopefully come this fall. Uh, Cause I think those uh, really just, give um the companies a lot of motivation and just um a lot of you know just fire underneath them to keep pushing forward and a lot of ideas and it's just great to experience those networking nights and collab nights where you get to just talk to people who are experiencing the same journey that you are um and with that being said obviously you know people are looking to start their own businesses every day and they have ideas floating around all the time. Um, so it's really important to talk to people like yourself who have kind of been through that journey and have advice to give. So um, what's one piece of advice that you would give to those who are looking to start their own business? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, first of all, I would say take the time to find out the complications of having a business. Um, in my first, uh, back in 2005, in my first two years, I, I earned almost nothing the first year. And I, and I lived off of savings. The second year, Hurricane Katrina came in and I worked with the Corps of Engineers as a contractor from, uh, gosh, uh, January, no, November, from November until April. And so in six months, I had multiple employees. We were in Miami, Gulfport, Mississippi, and New Orleans. And I brought in more money over a six-month period than I had earned in two years. Um, then the next year, I found out that I was supposed to pay a lot more in taxes than I expected. <laughs> so right. there's some complications involved that you learn about over time. So I would say uh, if, you're, if you just want to run this out of your pocket, and learn how to do something and all that, that's great. But at some point you have to go through the process of becoming an LLC or an S Corp or a C Corp. Go find somebody to help you. There are attorneys out there. If you wanna be an LLC, it costs you $100. And when you're done with the paperwork, you're done. There's no other fees, it's $100. If you wanna be in an LLC with a partner, then you need to have an attorney write up a partnership because you don't want to try to write that up yourself. Um, but if you want to be, if you want to start as an S Corp or a C Corp, start with an attorney because they'll get you through the process the right way. You won't mess any part of it up because you don't want that coming back to bite you six months later. So, and the last thing is don't mess with the IRS because they don't mess with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and that, you know, kind of going off that, all of those complications and those, um, somewhat overwhelming um, aspects of starting a business. Um, we have tried to um, work with Maynard Cooper and Warren Averett to get those uh, founder fundamental series out because it is something that is somewhat like just kind of unknown and uncertain um, because there's so much information out there on the internet um, where all of it just kind of becomes convoluted um, and some of it can say one thing and then you read another website and it says another um, and there's a hundred examples that all say different things. Um, so it we've really enjoyed getting to use those partnerships that we have and let those experts really sit down and kind of just go over the basics. Um, Cause that is such an important thing to consider when you want to become an entrepreneur. Um, it's not just about the becoming your own boss and hopefully making a lot of money and people love your idea. Um, there's a lot more to it. So um, I think that is such a, such an important part. And honestly, it's probably going to bring a lot of uh, learning curves and some hard moments, but yes. you know, how do you move on without those just in life in general and especially as um, a small business owner. So, um, but yeah, so your journey obviously uh, has included so many different aspects and a lot of different things that has you know, finally led you to where you're at now. Um, and obviously kind of just 
you know, rebooting uh, from a year like 2020 um, and really just preparing for the growth that is about to happen here in Huntsville. I think it's really going to provide a lot of opportunities for the cyber company, especially. Um, so, Bob, thank you so much for being on uh, the thank podcast you. today. Um, we love having you in the I2C. Of course, you and Jonathan, uh, you've been there pretty much since the beginning. I feel like I've always, <laughs> you know, known you guys are around. So um, thank you so much for being on. And we're super excited to see what the cyber company does in the coming months. Oh, well, I hope you, I hope you see something really good out of us soon. So <laughs> thank you so much. And I appreciate being on here and I love everything you guys do. I appreciate it. Thank you. And that concludes today's Spark Spotlight, you guys. I hope you enjoy getting to hear more about Bob's professional background and also a little bit more about how he has collaborated with other entrepreneurs here in the I2C. We're super excited to see what the cyber company is going to do in the next few months. Be on the lookout for who we're going to interview next. But in the meantime, make sure you're following us on all of our socials at UHI2C on Instagram and Twitter and UH Invention to Innovation Center on Facebook. Onward and upward.